Now, the first thing I want to talk about is what you started the book off with. And it's a story about the hmm. BMX bike. Cause that oh, spoke, yeah. it spoke right to my heart. I've got the same, I got almost the same story. So for you, it was the, the Swin predator. Yeah. Like a schweppy. Yeah. 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 But, the, but you saw the bike that you wanted and it was, I uh, wanted it bad. 200 bucks. And you went and asked your dad and just like mine, doggone it. He didn't, he did not whip out the cash. It's, right. For me, it was, it was, uh, you remember this, it was a red line. Uh, oh. It had the, it had the Oakley. I had to look them up before this to see it. Cause it had those wide flange Oakley. They're called Cobra grips and it was $400. Oh, wow. And, uh, just, just like your dad, <clears throat> my dad said, go, go work for it. And, uh, but you did, yeah, he did. He did. Can you believe that? But you did too. But the thing is I bought the bike. You did not. Um, you I didn't took, get the bike. You didn't get the bike. Why? Well, because I'd worked so hard for that two hundred for that hundred dollars I raised to get the bike. After I got all that money, I was like, man, that, that's too much work for that bike. Plus, I live in Michigan. Like it's gonna be snowing more than half the time. I just started doing all this this math that I hadn't even considered before when money didn't have any meaning behind it. But suddenly, I'm like, man, please, where where'd you grow up at? Kentucky. See, Kentucky. you didn't get a lot of snow in Kentucky. Nope. And I they mean, built like, a BMX track. So I, that's what set me up. I became a pro cyclist from that actually. Boom. So, yeah. it, yours was an investment. Yes. Mine was just a, it, it was just me consuming goods. So no, yeah. I didn't. So how has that it. played out with you and your kids? You've got five kids. When did it, ha, has it yet? Have you gotten to that point with one of the kids? Hey, I want that. And you pass that lesson on. Oh, absolutely. All the time. My kids know that they have to, well, initially, I always told my kids, you have to earn money. But now I teach them that you have to make your money, make some money for you, Yeah, which is really the way to go. So, yeah, my kids know because I don't hand them anything. But when I do, it's really because I feel like it's just a gift. Like there's no strings attached if I just give them something. So now any gift that I give them has so much more value because they know I don't just give uh, ad hoc. I'm not just going to give out of nowhere. So when I do, they're like, oh, wow, dad, thank you so much for this, which is cool. I saw Jerry Seinfeld. He said one of his kids asked him, he says, dad, are we rich? He said, <laughs> he said, I am. I am. <laughs> not, right. not, you, not you guys. <laughs> I am. You don't even have a job. <laughs> yeah. 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 I had you on the Ziggler show three years ago. Yep. And then I was with you at an event, a Ziggler event we did in nashville a lot has happened uh since yeah. that time point yeah i yeah. think at that point you were also maybe beginning or had you already gotten involved with selfie dad which is a movie out yeah. on amazon prime what was that experience yeah. like <clears throat> that was really cool man it was my first movie that i got to star in and uh and the directors and the producer the director was nice enough to allow me to rewrite any part of the movie while i was making the movie Wow. So if I felt like something needed a little bit of a tweak or it could be a little more funny if this happened, they let me do that, which is exactly what the Kendrick brothers let me do in War Room too. I had a much smaller role in War Room, but they were like, hey, we got the line, you nailed it. Now let me just do one the way Michael Jr. would do it. So that's what I did. I did one just, just the way I would. And those are all of the takes that they use in War Room. And it's the same thing in Selfie Dad too, man. So I'm super excited. It was a it was a really cool experience, like really, really cool. Did Sorry. you, well, it sounds like because of what you just said that you did, I was going to ask, did you get out of it what you intended as far as what you wanted to communicate, what you wanted people to hear? Yeah, so I didn't write that actual script, but I was able to communicate, like I never want to play a role that's going to counter the role that I'm playing in life, yeah. the, the real me. So in that aspect, absolutely. But I think Brad and those guys who directed and put it together, they did a great job of communicating. Really, it was a story about um, understanding that God is an awesome God, regardless of what you got going on. So in the movie, I play this guy who's all caught up in himself. He kind of ignores his family completely. And he's and he he does comedy and he got, he got this YouTube channel and it's blowing up. It's all exciting. And then all of a sudden, he realizes, man, I'm, I'm losing everything that really matters, even though the whole world is starting to know who I am. Yeah. So it's a really good story of that. And it's a lot of funny in there too. Fortunately, there's a lot of funny. You 
you know, your life is, I mean, you are, I think even in your bio, it says you're a traveling, you know, comedian. So we are still within, you know, we're past the year now as of this recording in this COVID pandemic and, and things that have gone on. I assume mm-hmm. that that, like all the folks that are speakers that I know, everybody that it stopped mm-hmm. that part of your life cold. Mm-hmm. What happened in your big, we have so many people in business that are still dealing with that, especially speakers. How did it affect you? And what did you do to, you know, pivot is the word everybody wants to use. What did you do to deal yeah. with it? Well, here's what's cool about that. I I do some stand up comedy. I mean, that's how I started. But now I'm doing a lot of keynote speaking, really, because what I'm really called to do is help people and even organizations understand what their purpose is and what they're supposed to accomplish. And I use comedy as a seasoning to do that. So it's more of a, of a comedic thought leader role. But what's very exciting about that was probably about six months before the pandemic hit, me and my team had just finished uh, this product we called a a uh, a DCS, which is a digital comedy show. So we were all set up in our studio. We had green screens, right? Everything set because I get so many inquiries a year. I mean, only my desire is to only do 35 events a year. I'm only gonna do like 35 events a year in a calendar year, but we get 1200 inquiries. So we were already working on, okay, how do we help some more of these people uh, learn what they want to learn through comedy? So we came up with this digital comedy show where it was me personalizing a comedy show and editing it together. So it's personalized to that organization. And we had just rolled it out maybe maybe five and a half months before the pandemic hit. So when the pandemic hit, we had this thing all laid out because I wanted to be home anyway. So this thing worked out perfectly. And then the, when the pandemic showed up, I'm at home really just loving being around my family. And now that it's lifting and people, in the, you know, we're getting a lot of calls again. I'm like, man, do I want to leave my house? This is yeah. awesome. So, <laughs> yeah. But I will go out. I will travel if I feel like I can ha- have a big enough impact on the people. I will yeah. Sure. Well, just, and I don't want to stick on this, but talking no, about good. the Talking about the past year and the pandemic mm-hmm. and whatnot, yeah. you also in June, I think is what I saw, you put a video out and you shared a story that you actually have in the book. And I had heard from you prior to that too, about an encounter, personal encounter you'd had with the police. And, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, so we'll call it a, a racially motivated issue. So you put <laughs> out in June, uh, yeah. right when we, June, 2020, when we hit, yeah kind of a a peak of racial issues, a video, and you shared that experience and talked, you know, in essence about loving people, forgiving people. Anyways, did you, I was wondering if you, I didn't see anything, but did you speak, did you use your platform to further speak to the racial issues that came up? It's not even a year ago. Yeah. So here's the thing, man. What I do is when those issues arise, I am super, super sensitive as to if this is something that I should be discussing because everyone has that knee jerk where they feel like they gotta say something. I really only wanna say what I should be saying when I should say it. So I never, I try to never react and always respond. So with that right there, the reason I felt like I should share the video and for those who don't know, it's a a story about when I was 19 years old, five, I'm sorry, 15 police officers came into my apartment wrongfully. One of them put a gun to my head, pulled the hammer back, and um, and I shared the story mainly because I had a lot of fans who were kind of looking to me to say, "Wow, what do you what do you think? Do you think this stuff really ha-? like?" I learned that a lot of my white friends and even fans didn't even think that that stuff really kind of took place. Mm. So I was like, "Man, I need to share this because," and I, I had never talked about it before. I'd never had that conversation with anybody before just because um, it's not something you bring up around the dinner table. Like you haven't, hey, I've been telling you about the time to police. Like it just don't come up. Yeah. yeah. But um, but I felt like I should share it. And then we shared it and the response was tremendous in a really, really good way. As in people started to understand because it's somebody that they know, somebody they care about, somebody who's encouraged them before had the same type of experience. Now, I do want to say, because I know people don't know the whole story, is as a result, you got in the book, I get into the details of it, but as a result of what happened that day, I'm sitting in my apartment, I'm crying, I'm in tears, the police leave, they just, they could have, like I could be dead and, and they just covered her tracks and nobody know the difference. But then a lady came knocking on the door really, really hard, aggressively, this Mexican lady. 
and um, and she was cr she was crying. She was inconsolable. And apparently, it was her house that had gotten raided in in my apartment community, and they took her husband away. And it was just her and her kids, and she's crying, and she's all un inconsolable. And she's saying they took everything. They took everything. They took everything. And I'm and I'm and I don't know what to do because the the police were in my apartment wrongfully because of her husband, her boyfriend, or whatever. So when the police, I'll back up just a little bit. When the police put the gun to my head, what they were doing is they asked me to reach for my wallet, which was over the stove. So as I reach over the stove for my wallet, one of the officers who just had a horrible attitude, he takes that, he takes his gun out at that point, puts it in my head, pulled the hammer back. And I remember tears rolling down my face because I don't know if this is the end or not. So they had me, they had me reach for my own wallet. First of all, why would you even have me do that? There's 15 officers in my apartment. One of you guys can get the wallet. Yeah. I can continue to sit on the floor. So it was as if he was using that as a tool. But anyway, fast forward, the lady comes in, she's crying. I've been sitting on the floor in tears for the last 30 minutes. She burst through the door crying. They took everything. They took everything. She's crying. She got two kids. She's inconsolable. She doesn't know what to do. I don't understand her because I don't speak Spanish. And uh, my instinct was, you know what I'm going to do? is I reached for my wallet. It had like $14 and some change in it. And I pulled all the money out and I gave it to her. And then she gave me this big hug. She grabbed her two kids and they walked out the door and I never saw her again. But what really took place in that moment, I thought I gave her a gift, but what really happened was in that moment, in this, the same tool, the same wallet that that officer used to say that I don't mean anything, that nobody needs me, that I could just be gone at any moment, is the same tool that I was able to reach into and give money to this lady. And she said to me, I need you, you matter. So that whole little spin right there was pretty awesome. So what I explain to people in the book is I say, listen, if, if you're hurting for whatever the reason might be in life, look next to you because there's probably somebody else hurting and healing can take place immediately if you would reach out and help those people. So I'm not upset with that officer. I mean, I don't know what kind of day he was having. I don't know what he went through in life. I can't even, like, I don't know what happened. I don't know, but I know healing started taking place as soon as I released the anger. And I released the anger because that lady was there. <clears throat> as far as the other 14 officers, they were there, they witnessed what happened, but I don't have anything against them either. Like, I think officers are awesome. I also think mailmen are awesome, but some of them are a little crazy. Let's be real. Like, mm -hmm. some of them will kick your dog when you're not looking. So it's just about what person is in the uniform that's supposed to be really serving you or are they just serving themselves? So, yeah. In the, in the story of that, yeah, the wallet change or the incident with the lady changing your paradigm from, is it fair for me to say from you being a victim to you yeah. being a servant? Absolutely. 100%. Because most people would listen. Most people show up. If you could picture a napkin, a white napkin, most people show up in situations and scenarios with that napkin tucked into their collar as to say, hey, feed me, serve me. The key is to take that same napkin, pull it out of your collar if you can visualize it, fold it in half and fold it over your arm like a servant. It's the same tool, but how are you gonna use it? Are you gonna use it to say, what can I get? Or are you gonna use it to say, what can I give? So I, th I that's do that. worth the price of admission for the podcast right there. I mean, we're at a, a, at a high of diseases of despair right now, mm. depression, suicide, whatnot. Mm. And, and I, my dad was a psychologist. I learned that a long time ago. One of the best treatments for depression is go find somebody to serve somebody who's yes. hurting. Yeah. Yeah. And it seemed like, <clears throat> it seemed as if it wouldn't make sense. Why well, I got to go serve some, why would I do that? But as soon as you do it, the game changes. I have a nonprofit called funny for the forgotten, where we go to homeless shelters and prison and abuse children facilities we take comedy there and those are some of my favorite shows in fact we just did one in downtown dallas for some homeless people a lot of the guys didn't laugh a lot of them were on drugs in the midst of it but the few that did i mean that's who i was there for i'm not there to get laughs i'm there to give them an opportunity to laugh yeah. that right there changes everything in a big way you have to ask what can you give that incident and you talk about you're on the ground crying lady comes in did you really realize the paradigm shift for yourself then, no. or was it in retrospect? No, 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 no. It was for, it was while I was writing this. Okay. Well, I knew it. I felt some change, some shift take place. I wasn't a Christian at the time, 
I didn't meet Jesus two years later, but looking back at that moment, I recognized what was going on because because I hadn't really talked about it a lot to to anybody except for some people who have been through something similar. And their response was always, well, aren't you mad? Well, don't, can't you, don't you hate police officers now? And I just didn't. Like, I just, I didn't leave. I felt bad for that one officer who did that thing. And maybe it was just that day. I didn't, and, and people, and I never understood why was I not so upset. But the truth is, I just didn't give him that much power. I mean, it was just like, it's obvious God was in control. I got some bigger things I'm supposed to be doing in my life right now. So I just moved on and I know the reason I was able to move on so quickly is because I found an opportunity to help somebody else. Like I know it, like I know it, like I know it. Yeah. And in the so, midst of this pandemic, when there's so many people hurting, some people say, some people focus on the fact that there's so many people hurting and how messed up things are. Yeah. But what you should focus on is the fact that there's so many people hurting which means there's a bunch of opportunities to help people. Yeah. I was interested for a couple of reasons of having you on here, Michael, but one of them is just the fact that you are a comedian. So here's, here's my story. I mentioned Jerry Seinfeld earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad, I grew up amongst the car world and, and those old classic cars. And so somebody yeah, recommended yeah. the show uh, that he has comedians in cars getting coffee. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I got enamored with that. I don't watch a lot of TV, but I got enamored with that show. Great show. It's a great show. Well, what I got though is realizing, cause you know, his, he talks about there. I only want to talk with comedians. I don't like hanging out. I'm not comfortable with other people. I want to talk with comedians. Is it felt like, or what I read into <laughs> it or experienced is it felt like such a rare breed of people who by proxy of what they do have to be incredibly observant of yeah. life, of behavior, of, of, of people in general, that is your job. Cause as you said, if you're going to get, or you said it, give a laugh, you've got to understand people and humanity in that. And, and reading your book, I felt like I, my, my perspective was, this is life lessons from a very observant person. Mm. And to that degree, I felt like there's a business book in there saying, you want to do, you know, you can yeah. do, how to win friends and influence <clears throat> people. It's understanding them. And that is your job is what it seems like. Yeah, absolutely. And I wondered, that's why I ask if you had that awareness, because reading the book, it feels like for whatever reason, you know, mm -hmm. thank God you did seem to notice life. Yeah. Ooh, that's a great point, man. Really, really great point. So when I'm on stage, here's what's happening. And this, I think this is what's happened with every comedian. I don't know how far they can go with this thought process, but it has to be true for most comedians on some level. But when I'm on stage, and especially when I first started, this is the this is what was happening. I would be presenting joke number one. But while I'm presenting joke number one, I would start to do the math on what I think joke number two should be based off how the audience is currently responding to joke number one. Then I'll move on to joke number three and start to do the math on what that joke should be based off how they're currently responding to joke number one and probably will respond to joke number two. I actually used to go seven jokes deep. I'll be thinking about joke number seven, even though I'm presenting joke number one. And the question I would be asking in between the jokes is, what joke should I do next to get more laughs from people? What should I do? How can I get more laughs? Well, what happened was after I had a change in mindset and truly understood that the question I should be asking is, what can I give to my audience? When I started asking that question, I couldn't go seven jokes in deep anymore. I couldn't go seven. I could only go maybe three, maybe four. And the reason is, is because when I ask the question, what can I give to my audience? Most of the times it's jokes, but sometimes it's something a little more. There may be some encouragement. There may be someone I need to point out in the audience. There's all these other opportunities to give to people in between these gaps. So everybody listening to this podcast right now in your life, there's gaps. My question to you is what question are you asking in between the gaps? Are you asking what can I get or are you asking what can I give? And if you don't know the answer to that question, I, I think you probably know the answer to that question. By default, we're asking what can we get? So if you can shift it and really truly start asking what can I give, I'm here to tell you that I believe some of these societal issues that we have, like you just mentioned, will start to alleviate because you're asking, what can I give? Because you have the napkin, you have the towel over your arm instead of tucked into your collar. 
you'll see those opportunities. So I love being on stage, just asking that question. In fact, in one chapter of the book, I, I was listening between the gaps. I'm doing a show in Sacramento. In fact, I'll be there uh, next week. I'm doing this big event in Sacramento. And in between the gaps, I said something encouraging. I said something to the effect of, listen, you guys know, some of you guys probably have a hard move you have to make. And it seems like it'll be, it seems like a ridiculous move and you're scared, you're fearful, but you can do it. Like you have what it takes to get this done. So that's all I said in between the gaps, instead of a joke, then I move on to the next joke. Well, after the show, I get a knock on my green room door and security says, hey, there's this guy out here who really wants to talk to you. I'm like, okay. So I go out there, it's a white dude, it looked like an Eminem looking dude. He got on a wife beater, he looking all tough and, and he looked like he was high, but I, as I looked closer, he wasn't high, he had been crying. And he said to me, he was like, yo man, I just came here to laugh, to get away from all this pressure, man. But I was laughing and then you said what you said, man. And I was like, and then he, he, and then he gets closer to me. He moves in even closer because there's security around. And he tells me, he says, man, I'm wanted in, in several states. And uh, the police looking for me. And I came here, man. Anyway, man, I just, I want to know if you would help. I want to turn myself in. Can you help me? Dude, and I called, like for real, like we called the police. This dude gets into the back of the, the car and looks at, gives me a hug, turns himself into the authorities and drives off. I'm blown away by this. But the only thing that really happened was I was listening between the gaps, asking what can I give as opposed to just showing up at a comedy show saying, give me laughs, give me laughs, give me laughs. Everyone has gaps in their life. What question are you asking in between the gaps? So when you come up with your, when you write your material uh -huh. with that, because what you're saying, you started off as a comedian to get mm -hmm. laughs right? through your own personal development growth. Yeah. You change that perspective. Now, day-to-day -day things happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I am not a comedian, but I'm a, I'm a, a communicator. I, I write content. I put this Absolutely. out there for people. And so things happen in my life, thoughts from, from reading, from talking with people. And I am thinking, how can I benefit others with that? Is that where your material comes from now? Or does it still start with, man, that's funny. And then how can I use that to yeah. bring a benefit to people? Yeah, so what's happening is I'm doing both, <clears throat> meaning I'm writing funny. Like I see funny all day. Even when I drop my kids off at school, they put a, uh, they always take their temperature before they let them out the car. Yeah. So they take the temperature, but then when I pick them up, I'm like, what are you gonna give them back to me? So I check <laughs> their temperature too. I'm like, wait a minute, I gotta keep, yeah. I'll see the funny all over the place. So I'll write the funny down, but then also I'll get a download of some inspiration or some understanding and I'll write that down too. So now I have this whole repertoire right. of information that I think can help people. So then when I get on stage, I'm just asking a question, what can I give to them to really help them? And more times than not, it's funny, it's laughter. But what I think is really happening is laughter is just a tool to open up someone's heart. Mm -hmm. And then I wanna be in position with this other content to be able to make a deposit that can make a pretty positive change. So in one chapter of the book, I know this, this will sound bananas, man. This is, a, so there's a chapter in there called I get it now and it's about a uh, school teacher who came to my comedy show we're in Peoria Illinois it's uh the home of Richard Pryor mm. and um I'm doing a comedy show there and uh we have an autograph line and there's a bunch of um I think it was a keynote address I'm not sure anyway this lady approaches me afterwards and she doesn't go to the she didn't buy any merchandise she just walked up to me and said oh she said you know what I get it now and she walks off I'm like, you get what? You didn't buy anything. What, what did you get? Like you didn't buy no merchandise? I don't know. Anyway, so <clears throat> she said, I get it now, but I didn't understand what she meant by I get it now. A year and a half later, I come back to Peoria, Illinois. Do you remember me? And I'm like, um, from how long ago? I mean, I don't know my, <laughs> I don't have a colorful past, but I just wanna make sure it's not. Anyway, so she said, um, she said, I was here about a year and a half ago. And she explained to me that she's a school teacher. And um, when she showed up at the show, she was $137 uh, negative in her account. And a friend gave her a ticket to the comedy show because she knew she had all of these issues. 
and uh, they wanted her to just let go and laugh for a little while. So I'm on stage, I'm doing my comedy, people are laughing and having fun, but I'm also asking the question, what can I give? Yeah. So I said some stuff, some encouraging things in between the jokes. And uh, she said, Michael, when you said what you said, I just got it. She said, so I was $137 minus my account. She said, on top of all these other issues, my favorite student uh, approached me that day at school, it was a Friday. Her favorite student said to her, um, hey, I'm not gonna be coming back anymore. Uh, she said that her mom was going to prison. She never met her dad before, and didn't have any other family. And she didn't, want, she didn't want to get into the foster care system and get caught up, so she was just leaving. So she didn't know what to do, the teacher didn't know what to do. She comes to the comedy show. I said what I said in between the gaps. The teacher walks up to me and says, I get it now. Goes and calls the student up and says, hey, I don't know what this looks like, but why don't you come live with me for a little while? And let's figure this out together. Wow. So on Sunday night, they're unpacking her clothes and the teacher finds a suicide note dated for Friday night, the same day that she called her. And then this teacher's looking at me and she says, I just want you to know that um, I'm so much happier now. And then she said, uh, I've actually adopted her. She's standing right over there. She pointed behind me. She said, I adopted her and her little sister. Would you like to meet him? What the deal, dude? I'm done. Now, had I just shown up just trying to get jokes, who knows what the scenario would be, but I just showed up saying, what can I give? What can I do? It's best to my ability. Yeah. And, um, and some really cool stuff took place as a result of it. That's just one of the cool stories in the book. It really is funny how life works. That's why we named it that. Man. I, yeah, I like the title. So on that, when we look at, we have so many people myself included, who uh, of faith, you know, on, on this show, in this show, the listeners, and often looking at, okay, here I am as a, you know, a husband uh, or a spouse, as a, as a parent, as a leader in my work, as whatever, and I need to be evangelizing to some degree, right? I need to be, I need to be showcasing the Lord for people and concerned about how they do that in everything they do. So here you are talking about, you know, you get the funny, but then you're trying to get some purposeful things in there as well. So I've seen you at a church in a setting like that. Well, I saw you at the, you know, the Ziegler event and yeah. by proxy of the audience, you were there to deliver a funny personal development talk. I mean, that's what's the point of it. Right, I've seen right, you at right. churches and it's an altar call. It was amazing. Now, right. but I want to come over here because I'm sure somebody has asked you. So when you're on entertainment or not entertainment, a tonight show or yeah. Jimmy Fallon or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. How are you doing it mm -hmm. there? Because my assumption is that there you're just doing your craft and the better you do that, you expand your audience, which then gives you permission to give them what they kind of the give them what they want to give them what they need. Yeah. That's a big line for me. Okay. Give them what they think they want. So I can really give them what they need. But what I'm doing when I'm on the tonight show or Jimmy Kim or any of those shows, I'm doing the same thing. But the key is, um, the, the thing that I'm doing is just listening in between the gaps. I'm just asking God, what would you have me to do? So if I'm on Jimmy Fallon and God says to do these jokes and really present them well, that's what I'm going to do. I never assume, like even when you see me at a church and I'm doing, like there's some pretty significant altar calls that happen. I think this, I was just at a church that only had uh, maybe 1,600 members. I think 300 people came to the altar. It was pretty awesome. But even at churches, I never agreed to do an altar call. I always agreed that I'm going to come speak. And then if I feel like as I'm listening between the gaps, that's what should happen, then that's what I'll do. My number one assignment is to try to hear what God wants to do. Because we never really know. We make some assumptions. So I'll ask this question to your listeners. But the, you, you, I, want to, I want you guys to just uh, answer this in your head. Don't answer it outside, out loud. So if, let's say you're walking down the street and you have two bottles of water and you're not thirsty and you see a homeless person who's thirsty, my question is, what should you do? My answer is, I don't think you give them the water. I think what you should do, most people would say, you give them the water. You got two hours of water, you're not thirsty. He's a homeless guy who's thirsty, give him the water. I say, don't give him the water. Instead, quickly ask God. Say, hey God, what would you have me to do? Because for all you know, behind you is a lady with a stingy heart and one bottle of water. And God's been working on her heart. And this is her opportunity to give the guy the water. In the first scenario, you play God. In the second scenario, you play for God. 
So I'd rather play for God and just listen in between the gaps. The key is to get good at listening so you can do whatever it is as opposed to showing up with an agenda prior to like, dun, 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 here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to save some people. Well, first of all, sit yourself down because you can't save nobody. Yeah. So, yeah. Have you gotten criticism ever from uh, your Christian brethren for being on, let's say a Jimmy Kimmel or something like that? Getting um, laughs, getting laughs, but yeah. no, not from being on there, but getting getting laughs, but then say, wait, right. you didn't, you didn't say Jesus. Yeah, you know, which is hilarious because like, I, I would say one time I was doing a show with uh, George Carlin and uh, this is before he died because that's probably the best time that's, to do a show with him. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it could be funny. So, so I mentioned this, I think it's chapter 22 or something. It's funny how life works. And I said, uh, so I'm getting ready to do a show with George Carlin and some of my Christian comedian friends said to me, hey, you know, he's an atheist, don't you? I was like, atheist? I don't know. Like, I, I didn't know that. And then they said, well, yeah, he's an atheist. You still going to do a show with him? I was like, dude, why wouldn't I do a show with him? I'll probably do shows with a bunch of atheists. I never asked him. Anyway, so we um, go down there and do the show. I do, and George Carlin goes up before me, right? And he does 15 minutes on why you shouldn't say God bless. For real. 15 minutes straight on why you should not say God bless. I went up after him. I was like, man, George Carlin, God bless him, man. That was, <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. So I'm going to show up the way I should show up no matter. I'm going to try to. I know I miss it. I know I miss it a lot. But I'm not really, I try not to be as concerned with my horizontal loved ones. Yeah. Meaning the people and what they're saying. But the vertical is what I'm really, really concerned about. Well, it just, it made me think of you because I've seen, you know, your different bits and you go on there and you'd be funny. It just reminded me. And I learned this. Well, it was as a pro cyclist when I realized, man, being, having that, it gave me a platform that I could have a positive influence there. And we started a nonprofit sports ministry through that. But I realized, so does that mean that in the race I'm out there, you know, prophesying and evangelizing because <laughs> right. I realized, no, what, what gives me the platform is winning the race. So I, I'll go oh. train, go win that race just as a racer. And then it gives me the influence with people that then that I can get, great. I can do something. Well, but then I saw that with you, when you go out there and you are funny, you master your craft and everybody listening has a craft, whatever business, whatever job they have, they've got that to do that. Well, gives us that influence mm -hmm. that then we can impart to people. But I think sometimes we, I have, I, I should own it. I have gotten a little confused sometimes thinking I've got to do both. It's, it's, it's got to be, I can't do anything for the craft if yeah. it doesn't include my, yeah, my, my evangelistic aspect or, right. or you know, the, the calling, I'll say that. Right. Yeah. Right. And but, we're not even all called to, I mean, Matthew 28, 19, everybody has a great commission, but everybody's not like, I want to be cunning. I want to be clever. I want to do exactly what God, what I feel like God is saying, do and win. And it may mean I'm on stage in front of 2000 people. And God says, just be funny. Just be fun. I don't want you to do just funny. And I just bring the funny. And then after the show, one person walks up to me and has a question and decides to surrender himself to God, or should I say to the authorities, which is exactly what happened in the Sacramento case. And do surrenders his life literally over to the authorities mm -hmm. as a result of that. So I'd yeah. rather be like obedience is better than sacrifice. Uh, that's <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm going to come back here. Cause I, again, I was thinking about you watching these Seinfeld, this Jerry Seinfeld comedians and cars getting coffee. And again, I, I mean, it was funny and interesting, but I, I just got enamored again with the personalities of him mm. and the people he had on and their interactions and their sharing of their insight, you know, into life. Well, he's, I, I think pretty well known again. I'm not a, a, yeah, a yeah, yeah. fan necessarily of, of, I don't know him and know him deeply, but he seems to always be pretty clean and yeah, pretty, yeah. at least clean. I don't know if he's always uplifting, but pretty clean. And I saw him on one and he criticized somebody who was very foul mouth in that and said, in essence, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the details, but that he felt like that was a cop out to true comedy. And yeah. I thought about that with you because it's easy to say, oh, Michael Jr., oh, he's, he's Christian, so he has to say nice things and keep his <laughs> language keep his language right. clean. And over here, I'm thinking, no, Jerry's saying it's a more brilliant form of, of comedy. I mean, my kids laugh if I fart. 
There's no skill needed <laughs> for that at all. So yeah, to use eat. potty, potty yeah. talking language. And I thought it, it puts, it put you in a different light of, no, it's not just the nice, clean, you know, Christian comedian. Your craft is more skillful by not having to rely on the junk. Is that fair? Yeah. 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 That, that's very true, man. Because what happens is, is if somebody says a four letter word, the re reaction gets blended with nervous laughter and it's mistaken for entertainment, but it's really not. It's just a reaction. Yeah. It's nervousness. Oh, it's, it's shocking. Most of that is, but if you pull all that away and just tell the story, if it's still not funny, that just means it's not funny. If you, if you had to That's put funny. that there to get that little bump, that means you, you, you got to go back to the drawing board and start to write. That's why I'm so blessed. Like God, I didn't know God when I first started doing comedy, but he set me up to do clean comedy even before I knew him. Like I was doing clean comedy way before I was a Christian. And then once I became a Christian, I was like, oh, this is making sense now. It just was so cool. How why why did you? I was literally going to ask that because I saw in the, you know, in the sequence uh -huh. there that, wait, you were doing, you had the bet with your buddy about not saying, you know, using four letter words before, before you yeah. became a Christian. What was the I'm impetus for that? What was, what was the catalyst yeah, so, that? So yeah. me and a friend, like, like you mentioned, we just made a deal. Like we, we said, if, if you curse, you have to stand still and I'm gonna hit you in the chest hard as I want to and then vice versa. Why? And Duke can hit hard just because we, well, two reasons. One, we wanted to expand our vocabulary as we would tell people. Number two, we really wanted to just hit each other because if you <laughs> hit somebody hard, the girls are looking and you all are tough and you get to, like, it was, it was, it was silly. It was ridiculous, yeah. but it built up a, um, a negative association with using those, using that language. Right. So I didn't want to, so I had this negative neural association to use a negative language. And then when I started doing comedy, I just didn't want to. And then when I had kids, I was like, man, I want my kid. I remember being in a green room with some huge name comedians. Some of the names you've said already, some big name comedians. And I was in a green room at this comedy club in uh, Hermosa beach. And I had two of my kids with me and, uh, and they came back and they met the people or whatever. And then they went into this other room and my kids had some food in the other room. And then uh, one of the guys, big, 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 big name. He said, um, he said, man, I don't know how I'm gonna tell my kids what I do. He, his kids didn't even know what he did yet. And he was contemplating how is he, what conversations he's gonna have with them when they finally find out what their dad does for a living because he didn't want them to see the show because it was so vulgar and whatnot. And my kids were at my show. Yeah. Like they saw me perform. So that was just very enlightening for me to see that. In fact, there was one time I was doing a show and uh, Chris Rock uh, went on before me. I think he before me or after me, I can't remember. And I had never met Chris before. And then we're talking and he saw my set and he said, man, that was hilarious. That was really funny. He was giving me all these compliments. So we're talking, we're 15 minutes into our conversation. And he gets this look on his face like, wait a second. He said, you didn't curse, did you? I was like, oh, no, I don't. Yeah, I don't. Really. He said, man, I didn't even realize. He said, oh, that is so awesome. He said, man, that is so cool. I didn't, he had his own revelation in a minute, which made the compliment even greater. Yeah. Because he saw the funny, even though those words weren't there that he would normally use or some people in his circle would use, which is a big compliment. That's but I, I really believe what you're saying is true. If you work hard enough at whatever the craft is and you're doing it, really to please God, like his, his light is going to shine right through that thing. Well, even with the, again, not to just expound on curse words, but when people use them and feel like I, I saw, I had literally just saw somebody that I respect who had somebody on their show and he said, warning, there's a <clears> lot of cursing in there, but they use it to really drive the point home. I thought, I, I hope that I'm skillful enough to drive a point home without having to exactly. use. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. on this back to, again, this comedic, <clears throat> personality, mm -hmm. mindset, whatnot. Uh, so Zig Ziglar is famous for saying that Absolutely. everybody's in sales and it's good, real sales I and mean, really serving people in sales. It's a transfer of emotion. And mm. again, coming back to you, when you talk, you talk so often, you met, you had a bunch of different lines on the tenets of comedy uh, or even of a joke, you know, and the joke, you said it's the timing, <laughs> the rhythm, the pacing, and you study this stuff. And, you know, we know mm -hmm. of Zig, he was not this uh, born 
perfect guy on stage. He studied it like yeah. mad and he knew yeah. his stuff. And I've seen that, especially seeing you multiple times when I see you yeah. and I'll see you do some of the same bits. You ebb yeah. and flow through those, but this is a craft right. that you have mastered. And again, it feels like, well, talk about sales. It feels like comedians have got to be some of the best. You're selling the hardest thing there is. Yeah. And, and get, it's a, <clears throat> yeah. And it's like reality too, meaning with comedy, a lot of people don't understand it. When, but when you're delivering comedy or even mixing comedy into like a keynote address, anything that has comedy in it is actually like a raw truth. What I mean is, is if someone gets on stage and they sing, the audience could have an opinion about that either way. One person could be like, that was amazing, sing so well. Another person could be like, that was really bad. Or if you get up and give a speech, they could have an opinion. That was really bad. That was really good. The audience could be split completely yeah. because they get because they get to choose what they're going to say as if it was your was your communication uh, effective or not. But when it comes to comedy, they don't get to choose. They either laugh or they don't. And it's absolute truth. Meaning when you get on stage, you say your joke. If it's funny, they're going to laugh. And you don't have to worry about anything in between because someone can't laugh and then say that wasn't funny. You're that's just true. dealing with this. You're just dealing with that's straight true. truth. There's no way around it. So I think that's why a lot of people tend to be a little afraid of the comedy. But there's some tools that people can use. I don't know if I talk about this in the book or not, but one thing, instead of cursing, so this is one little move. There's probably some public speakers out there. So one thing that I do, man, I don't think I've even shared this publicly before, is if everyone has a radius when they're on, sp on stage speaking, I have about a 24 inch radius. I never leave 24 inches, maybe maybe 36 inches. I don't really move that much on stage, but if I really wanna bring a point across, all I have to do is leave that radius while I'm making the point. The right. brain, the people will start to look at it and be like, wait a second, what? wow. And that thing will stick out and they will not be able to articulate why it stuck out so far. It's simply because I broke a radius that you hadn't seen before. So, and that's the same thing people are doing when they use curse, curse words. They're breaking a radius. Problem is, is they're breaking it so much, it becomes yeah. the new radius, it expands. Or when people raise their voice, they're breaking a radius, but if your voice is high all the time, your radius just expanded, and now there's nothing new about what you're doing. The smaller your radius is, the bigger impact you can have on people. Just like I mentioned earlier with my kids, I didn't give them a lot of stuff. They had to earn it or work for it. But when I did, they were very, very happy about it because I went out of my radius to do so. Are you, are you talking about your kids? Are you funny in real life? Uh, that's a stupid thing to say, but you know what I mean? Do you do that? Cause I've known some people who are real funny on stage. But they're yeah. pretty serious off stage, but I've known some others that they're kind of cut up a lot. Where do you yeah, fall in that? What I do your kids think? So I don't like when I'm disciplining my kids, I'm like, hey, where well, are you from? <laughs> who drove the furthest? It is funny. <laughs> yeah. So um, I am very, I'm, I'm, people tell me that I'm pretty much the same on stage and off, but off stage, I'm not, I'm just not talking as much. Meaning on stage, it's really up to me to hold the whole entire conversation. So I'm, my, my brain is constantly thinking, if you ever see me at a party with a bunch of people there, first of all, it's not me, it's somebody who looked like me, because I don't like going to parties. <laughs> yeah, but if too. you do see me, if I have to be there, I'm probably tucked away in a corner somewhere close to the exit, just watching people and observing what they're doing. Yeah. But I, I'm never, by any means, have I ever been the life of a party before. I'm just not that dude. Yeah. Do you feel like you are somewhat, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but always on the job, always thinking, always, like you said that you're watching people, you're watching events, that you're always looking for material or is it do you just let it come organically if it hits you right or not yeah that makes sense. you know what's interesting about that man is to think the question i've really been asking my whole life hasn't been how could i be funny it's really been something along the lines of how could i help people and what i mean is is if i'm asking how can i help people more times than not i would come up with a joke that could cause that person to laugh but now that i understand that at first I was doing that just to get laughs from people, just to get acceptance. Now that that's no longer the case, I'm still asking how can I help people? Sometimes it's something funny or sometimes it might just be opening a door for them or, or giving them a compliment or something. So when I'm in public somewhere, if I'm sitting down looking at people, one of the questions that is running through my mind 
is really what can I, how can I help somebody? What can I do? And it's just, it's just part of who I am. It's almost in my subconscious. It's almost like a primary question. And everyone has a primary question they're asking, even if they're not aware of the fact that they're asking it. Mine just have to be, always be, how could I help? Which sounds good. The problem is, is what if nothing's wrong? Yeah. Like you're still asking the question, how can I help? And then you find something wrong. So, so it's a balance. But uh, I'm always finding comedy and then I'm being strategic on when I release it. Or I'm finding revelation and then being strategic on when I re release it, whether it be a corporate event or keynote, whatever it might be. You, you know, you talk about, or, or just looking at that aspect of you being so observant of mm -hmm. being so aware. I mean, that's what strikes me about your book. It actually reminded me of Guy Kawasaki. I don't know if you know Guy, but it's Silicon Valley uh, legend and author. And he wrote a book yeah, called- Yeah, he wrote uh, Port, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. No, that's, that's good racial stereotyping. But uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very, very, I mean, he, I'm no, sorry, he looks, poor dad. <laughs> He looks really, he looks really close. That's a uh, Kiyosaki. Yeah. That's. Yeah, really. Oh, that's stereotyping because their uh, names are that close together. No, but they both look Hawaiian or Asian or something. I thought you were referring oh, to that. Oh, no, that's stereotyping. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> okay. I, I thought I'd call it out. That's funny though. Yeah. That's funny. Uh, so Guy, but he wrote this book called Wise Guy. And it was mm. very much like yours of these life observances along the way. And it mm -hmm. just was impacting to me. I think that I see the wisdom in retrospect, but it made me realize how often I'm not thinking about the event in the moment. And to what you said, in, in essence, over and over in the book of what well, you did, you had a chapter. One of the first chapters was about that, about look at that. Maybe it was the first chapter, the hard thing that may be happening. And in essence, what can I learn from it as opposed to the gut mm -hmm. reaction of just you know, some people are going to be a feel a victim and just be upset about it. I'll tend to look at it and just focus on how I can fix it. But you're mm -hmm. saying over here, no, what can I learn from? It? I, I want to be more aware so I can learn that lesson Absolutely. quicker. Yeah. Yes. The key, really, what one of the biggest things I've learned, man, is to think about what I'm thinking about. Like, what am I That's thinking good. about after something happens? Like That's after good. something goes down or in the midst of it, what am I thinking about? What am I feeling? And then even question why I'm feeling that way or why I'm thinking that way. Like, like if someone says something negative or if I think it's negative, then why, like a great question. I heard somebody ask a great question once, which was uh, person A hit person B. And then they said, why? And everyone came up with these different answers. And I'm, and I'm amazed at why did they come up with all, they said, because person B stepped on their foot because this happened, they came up with all these scenarios. And I'm thinking, Maybe he hit him with a hundred dollars because you could hit somebody with money too. Boom. There you go. Like it could be anything, but just that question causes you to think, why did I think it was a violent hit? Why did I assume they were fighting? What? And then why did I say he, he hit him with some money? Like it could, w w there could have been a mosquito on guy A's back and you just saved him from getting bit by a mosquito and it could have been allergic to mosquitoes. Like there's no, t like there's so much that could happen. So I like to question, I like to think about what I'm thinking about and then question it so I can get better. Yeah. My thought was why did person A hit person B? Because person A has some anger issues, apparently. Right. Uh, think about what, that's a, that, that's going to be a book title right there. Think about yeah. what I'm thinking about. That's, and that's it. My, that's what I felt like you called us to so much in the book was being aware of what's happening and just that, because I tend to, Again, especially with the negative stuff, the hard stuff, I think we're in a culture right now that's really fallen into this victim mentality and complain mm -hmm. and gripe and, and, and whatnot. And I would say, I don't do that, but I tend to be linear in that. And I'm okay, I'm here at A, how do I get to Z? How do mm -hmm. I fix it? How do I get beyond it? How do whatever, <laughs> instead of taking captive, what are my thoughts on this? Yeah, that's great. Well, it's great. It's what you wrote about. That's what I got out of your book so much yeah, is again, yeah. that observance, which is so interesting how that leads into what your job is to be observant. And in the yeah. Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people. I feel like you could, you should be doing, there should be comedic sales training courses or yeah. personal relationship skills courses by comedians, because what you have to do, because you did, you talked about the skill of 
the practice of the discipline of comedy so often yeah. in the book. Yeah. And I yeah. kept seeing this is this is business 101. This is PR skills. Mm. This is sales 101 of, yeah. yeah, being aware, which you. Man, I'm so glad with. you picked up on that because we put some little subtle things in there, hoping that people will grab a hold of it in whatever their profession is, because every story that I tell, there's some sort of application as well. Like we put application every single chapter, made the chapters very, very readable, but I wanted to put it in a story format because you can remember a story, you can see it, you can feel it, you can get caught up in it. And then we hit you with the application. So that 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 means a lot that you caught that. That means a lot. Well, thanks. So, so help us as we're listening because not many people listening are professional comedians and actors and, really? and speakers and what, well, maybe a couple, maybe a couple. Mm -hmm. They are doing whatever their job is. They're a plumber, mm -hmm. they're a, a, an accountant, they're a coach, they're a, an author, whatever, mm -hmm. on how to use their craft in the same way, to use that to open up the opportunity to give that deeper service. Yeah, so here's what I always, this is that's a, that's a great question, man. So I think the key is, is two things. One is, what question are you asking? Are you doing whatever your profession is because it's something you like to do? Or are you doing whatever the profession is because you're helping some people you feel like you're supposed to help? Everybody, unfortunately, I was just talking to some, uh, some, some high school students and I said, whatever you do, do not go to college to answer the question, what do I like to do? Do not pick your degree based off what I, what do I like to do? Pick your degree based off of who do I want to help? Hmm. If you can, if you do that, cause if you, it'll change the game, figure out who you want to help because helping people will put your alarm clock out of business. Waking up to do something will cause you to hit the snooze. So for all those people who are in their professions right now, the key is to really figure out who are your people? Who are you called to? No matter what job you have, no matter what you do in life, you're going to be serving other people. So the question is, who are the people you're called to? Meaning, are they single moms? Are they uh, dads who are not really sure how to be the dad? Or is it is it people who have um, who need legal help in a sp specific field? But the key is to attach it to some human beings, not to a task. I had this conversation with a lady in my audience once, and she said, well, I know that I'm called to the single moms, but I can't help them because I work at a UPS store. I was like, what do you mean you can't? Like, sure you can help them. She said, well, how am I gonna help them? I work at a UPS store. I said, well, she was in the Dallas area. I said, well, what UPS store in the Dallas Metroplex has the highest amount of, or what area has the, the highest density of single moms? She's like, I don't know. I said, well, could you find out which ones do? And she said, I bet I could. I said, well, is it possible that you could transfer to that location. She said, it is possible. I said, so if you transfer to that location, now you're around more single moms. If you didn't do anything but put a stamp on one of their envelopes, are you helping your people? And she started getting teared up wow. because she saw how easy it was to put herself in position to help her people. And then what if you struck up a conversation with one? What if you happen to notice that a few of them had the same issues? Now you're in it. It doesn't have to, your purpose doesn't have to be some great thing that you get to someday. There's steps you can do right now to get closer to your people and in doing so live more fulfilled. That's I'm going to take that think. home. Uh, so just so you know, this is, this is the benefit of me getting to do the show is I'm the first student and <laughs> I, uh, I have a daughter. She produces my shows and she's looking at doing some new things and she's struggling a little bit. She feels the weight oh. of doing something important, doing her calling right now. I'm saying, just go experience life. But that right there to base what she wants to do, not a, in the, her sense, it's not a degree, it's not school, but what she's going to mm -hmm. go after on who she wants to help yes. is beautiful. Dude, listen, I did this with my niece. You got to do this with your daughter, right? So my niece knows she loves kids and she wants to help kids. I said, there's a lot of kids out there. Who are you called to? And she was like, I don't know. What, what do you mean? So I took her out to this uh, basketball court that we have and I took four cones, right? And I set the cones out, no, it was five cones and I set the cones out. And I, and I said, this cone right here represents um, handicapped children. 
And I said, and this one represents uh, children with emotional problems. This one represents children with learning problems. And I set all these cones out and I, and I put her across from the cones. And I said, so which kids do you want to help? She said, I love them all. I want to help all the kids. I was like, of course you do. I said, but if you could only step to one cone, yeah. which one would you step to? And, I, and she had to struggle with that decision in a controlled environment. I said, which one do you feel like is calling you? And she stepped to the, the kids with the, emotional, um, with the emotional issues. And I said, are you sure? And then I added a little bit of heat to it. I said, because this handicapped kid really needs somebody. Mm. Are you sure you're going to not do this and help this person? So I had her step back. I wow. said, I need you to think about it. And she thought about it and thought, and then she stepped to the kids with the emotional issue. And I said, wait a second, there's one more cone. I said, this cone is a wounded puppy that just got hit by a car, like, right? There's a vet close by, but are you going to, like, what are you, who are you called to help? And she, and it got her super laser on those kids because in life, as you're going through things, puppies are going to show up. There's all sorts of distractions that in the moment will be emotional, but is it really what you're called to do? So we created a, a, a safe environment for her to make the choice. So now when she, now she's going to school next year, she can be clear. She can be laser about who she's called to because all these other pop-ups are going to happen. But you can do a bunch of good things, but you really want to do the great thing. You want to do the right thing. Yeah. So it's a really cool exercise. Dude, I love the exercise. I love the analogy. I'm going to have, yeah. uh, I've got, uh, I've got a couple hundred children. We're all going on vacation here shortly. I'm going to do that uh, with oh, some that of them. Awesome. They will have that fun awesome. with it. And I love the, yeah, the tactile, tangible aspect. Yeah, of you let, can't, them, let them, yeah, let them struggle with that. You can't help them all, but you're going to be able to really, really impact somebody. Who do you feel like? God, and that was the question too. I was like, who is God calling you to? Which yeah. area, which, like sit here and think about it. She started getting a little teary, man, a little choked up. And I was like, you gotta, like, who is it? Who do you feel like it is? Pray, I'll take my time. I'll just sit here and wait. It was a yeah. great exercise, dude. So I got to, I got to say one more thing on you as a comedian. I thought about you leading up to this because they actually was the same daughter. She loves, she's a foodie, loves, loves good food. And she had this record, mm. this record, uh, recommended restaurant. And she says, yeah, dad, we, they've got this great veggie burger and sweet potato fries, whatever. It's real healthy. And after you, after you eat it, you still feel okay. As opposed to the place down here with the greasy, whatever, and you eat it and you feel mm. like crap. And I thought mm -hmm. that came to mind as I thought about, comedians about funny stuff. I like watching stuff with my Ooh, family. And it's not that I'm a, it's, well, it's not that I'm a prude completely, but sometimes you watch the stuff and you come out of it. And I just kind of feel a little, a little icky. And when I, oh watch, when I get your stuff, read your stuff, listen to it, watch it, I feel uh, lifted up. And I, I don't know uh, what greater testimony Man, to thank you for that. Well, and I, I, for all of us in what we're doing, can we, as opposed to the norm over there, lift people up in whatever it is, whether we're a comedian on stage, whether we're an accountant, whether we're a uh, guy changing the oil under the car, like you spent so many years uh, doing, man, I'm, I'm grateful for your craft, your devotion to it and your devotion to loving on people. Mm -hmm. And for you putting this book out, I mm -hmm am getting so much. I will help other people with it. I'm eager for oh, the audience you. here to, uh, to listen to you, get exposed to you again and to buy the book. So thank yes, you, Michael. Please go to, uh, go to funny how life works book.com. Yep. You actually can get a signed copy there. It's available wherever books are sold. But if you want a signed copy, you go to funny how life works book.com. We'll actually get you a signed copy of the book. So that's exciting. I will do so. Thank you again, Michael. Dude, you're awesome, man. Thanks.